everybody. Just before we start the show, we want to say a big hi to new listeners coming to us from BBC Sounds, where the podcast now exists. Welcome to the fold. We are no such thing as a fish. I'm Anna. I'm here with Dan. Hi, Dan. Hello. What do we do? Yeah, yeah. So there's four of us. We are QI elves. We are the people who are involved in the TV series QI. And if you enjoy that, if you enjoy all the weird facts, this is a real kind of concentrated distilled version of it where we just sit around and share the best, most wonderful, most odd things that we've discovered over the last seven days. Yes, and also if you enjoy the occasional incredibly immature sense of humour on QI, then you'll get that by the bucket load here, and with a little bit of a warning that there's the occasional bit of adult content. So there is swearing, there's the odd adult theme, a little bit of animal sex sometimes makes it in, sometimes a little bit of human sex facts make it in, but it's all for the purpose of learning weird, interesting, amazing facts. And you'll notice we've got 10 episodes up there right now on BBC Sounds, and from now on, every episode will be published there. That's right. Now, we also just want to quickly address the members, the existing listeners of our show, and particularly the members of Club Fish. We know that many of you might have joined Club Fish because you get an ad-free version of our show. Well, if you head over to BBC Sounds, you are going to get the ad-free version of the show, but I wouldn't leave Club Fish. You know what's there, the amazing Discord, the behind-the-scenes bonus content like the compilations and drop us a line. You want to miss out on Andy saying bye at random moments? No, you don't. Absolutely not. So, if you do want to go in just for the ad free stuff absolutely head over to bbc sounds otherwise stay with us in club fish and uh, enjoy all the background content so huge huge welcome to the bbc sounds listeners thanks for joining us um this is a weekly show and we're going to keep going for the next 400 years so enjoy and uh on with the show on with the show Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoburn. My name is Dan Schreiber. I'm sitting here with James Harkin, Anna Tashinsky, and Alex Bell. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, that is James. Okay, my fact this week is the artist Goya, who was famously a deaf man, lived in a house called the House of the Deaf Man. It was actually named after a different deaf man who lived in that house. <laughs> so, go. first of all, what is Goya's full name? Because I think you were practicing. Oh, I <laughs> thought you were calling back something that had happened before the. I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, his full name was Francisco Jose de Goya y Luciente. Lovely. Nice. Uh, that is a lot less Spanish than I went in the pre-show chat. <laughs> um, and he is a very famous artist. He was around in the early 19th century. And he's kind of the the link between the old masters like Rembrandt and whoever and the modern artists because he was doing lots of satires and lots of incredible stuff. He is an absolutely incredible artist. He's probably my favourite artist. Is he? Mm. Yeah, I think yeah, so. I, I can actually wow. see why. I can connect those two things. Oh yeah, go yeah. on. Yeah, uh, well, we'll get into it. Some of his like dark, disturbed <laughs> latter paintings. But can you please tell us about um, this? Okay, I want to know, did this deaf man name the house after himself, the deaf man? No, it was named by locals as that because this deaf man had lived there and then later Goya moved in there. And, and did he move in there because he was only looking for houses <laughs> called House for a Deaf Man? Yeah, he actually Googled House for a Deaf Man and this is what came up. <laughs> yeah, but there was nothing so cool. special about the house that made it like accessible for deaf no, people. No, it was a really nice house. Right. Yeah. And he was a former court artist, so he had money and had a pension from the, from the monarchy and stuff like that. It was also sort of away from the politics. Uh, he sort of wanted a place to retreat and yeah. sort of mm. get away because he was heavily involved his art would often you know either do satire or make political statements yeah about. exactly he thought if he hangs around where the spanish inquisition are then there's a decent chance he might get you know mm. um, so he wanted to get away but the one interesting thing about this building is his most famous 
work for people at home perhaps is called Saturn devouring his son you might know it it's like a real devilish face and he seems to be biting the head off what could be a chicken or could be his son or something like that it's a really sort of dark painting it's harrowing it's like really quite scary yeah if you google it you'll probably recognize it from memes and stuff Um, but that was (laughs) (laughs) what he would have wanted (laughs) Uh, but it was on his wall in this house uh, and actually he painted a load of these kind of satirical paintings on the wall of his house and actually they ended up being chipped off because he didn't intend to sell them or anything they were just murals in his house they're known as the black paintings now Precisely, because didn't yeah. he have a whole his whole first period of his life was much more involved in politics like you say painting on commission for royal courts and there was an awful lot more like of a positive vibe to his paintings and then he got really sick and he went deaf as a result of one of his illnesses and then he became very like depressed and obsessed with illness and obsessed with like death and uh, yeah. kind of neurotic and these paintings we think reflect this dark state that he was in yeah. but they're yeah. all really weird and mysterious as well we don't actually know that the painting is called Saturn devouring itself we don't know anything about we know nothing about really. them yeah. we don't know because like you say they were all painted on the walls and then the wallpaper had to kind of be chipped away from the wall yeah. and then put onto canvas yeah. but like a lot of art historians think that like they had to be very significantly altered when that happened yeah. a lot of definitely painting restoration yeah. yeah you can spot little bits of it that really they think uh, again it's almost theory is that damage yeah. or is that what he intended uh, there's one called the dog it's basically a landscape where you see a dog's head sticking up at the uh, bottom of the painting and you know is he coming over a sort of horizon is he coming over a bump in a hill is he drowning in quicksand a lot of people say he's drowning I looked at it and thought oh it's like it's like kind of begging like you get a dog at a table begging but a lot of people have interpreted it as drowning yeah but but we have no idea because Goy never intended anyone to see these these were private kind of things that he did on his wall at home you know if a kid draws yeah. on the wall they get in trouble don't they and yeah, <laughs> yeah what kind of example is that setting you've got to own yeah. your own house in order to then make that those true. decisions right that's got to imagine if he was renting how pissed off <laughs> <Yeah. he'd be. laughs> you're not getting your deposit back <laughs> yeah so he gave it he gave the house to his grandson and then his grandson sold it to i don't know a baron and and mm-hmm. then the that's baron. the guy who went let's let's take this off put this on canvas donate it to the museums the dog in particular um in the museum where it is the curator of that museum says that there's not a single contemporary painter in the world who does not pray in front of the dog it's that important oh, yeah. to uh, yeah. i've got to say the dog doesn't impress me as the i like i think some of the others are better the really dog is a bit kind dog of, doesn't impress apart, apart from anything else it's like it's a massive portrait shape vertical painting and the dog's right in the bottom and most of it's just brown like i love 95 percent of it's just brown which you learn about malievich by the way <laughs> okay whose painting is just black it's like literally just a black square yeah. right yeah <laughs> if you don't like something that's 90 percent brown you know yeah. No, like no, that. No. I think the only reason people like the dog is because you've filed through these like witches and decapitated bloodied people tearing mm. each other to shreds and then you've got oh little black dog people love an animal yeah people love he knew, animals he knew the TikTok generation was yeah. coming up he, <laughs> knew, he knew memes were on the way he's so clever it's actually doge isn't it <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, there's so much written about his art and the interpretations of it, but what do we know about Goya the man? Uh, Here's a few things. Here's a few (laughs) things we know. Are you presenting a documentary? I I thought you were on the South Bank show for a second. (laughs) It really felt like I was Melvin Bragg all of a sudden. Um, The smell of orange. Love the smell of orange. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, The smell of a girl's armpit. Loved it. <laughs> as long as it had an orange in it. <laughs> <laughs> you get this from like a dating profile or something. Yeah. Well, this is, this is weird. The whiff of tobacco, the aftertaste of wine, okay. and the twanging rhythms of a street dance. This is all okay. according to a biography nice. that was written about him. Is um, it according to him himself? Because it feels yeah. like, okay, so oh, yeah. he, he wrote this down somewhere. It wasn't someone going, he seems like the kind of guy who loves sniffing girls' armpits. Let's put that in. <laughs> yeah. I love the smell of an orange. Like, who doesn't? Like, orange is generally pleasant. Why would you, like, note that down? Well, maybe he chucked the orange thing in there to make up for the weirdness of the girl's armpit so that there was just, <laughs> yeah. I'm not totally crazy. I like normal things too. He was the first major artist to paint a woman entirely nude in mm. a profane style. As in the, well, this was the one that he got summoned by the Inquisition yeah. for, right? So profane means not religious. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was the naked maha. Yes. Who was deemed, I think, indecent and prejudicial to the common good. So, yeah, and a ma- I didn't know what a macha was, but machos and machas were, according to the New Yorker, this is how New Yorker described them, flamboyantly cheeky lower class dandies. And oh, I didn't <laughs> that's know what that. I've got on my dating profile. <laughs> <laughs> lower class, please. You know the way you talk, Alex. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, got summoned by the Inquisition, and I just find his tangles with the Inquisition quite bizarre. Yeah, because so who, weird. Well, who knew the Inquisition was still bloody happening the start of the 19th century? Yeah. It, was oh, just, they lasted for ages, didn't they? It lasted ridiculously long. It was practically going since late medieval times, and still they're struggling on, clinging on. I think they were quite toothless by <laughs> yeah. then. That Python sketch was topical. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but he did. He got away with it with the naked painting, I believe, by saying, "Well, if you think this was gross, then you're condemning your former king," because he said he was emulating a Velasquez painting uh, that Philip IV of Spain had loved. So he was going, well, yeah. your king loved this, basically. Mm. Your dead king. Mm. So what are you going to do? Well, the interesting thing I think about the naked Maha is that he gave it, or sold it, I should say, to Godoy, who was the prime minister of Spain at the time. Mm -hmm. And the story goes that we know that um, Goya made two versions, the naked Maha and the not naked Maha. The clothed Maha, mm -hmm. you might call it. <laughs> uh, and the prime minister supposedly kept the clothed one on display mm. and whenever his friends would come round after a few whiskies he would say look at this oh. and he would pull like a secret lever and the wall would spin round oh, and wow. the naked that's one like, would come that's out. like one of those pens where you turn it upside down <laughs> it's, like, it's actually so tacky <laughs> well that's the story and that's supposedly what happened but for sure the reason that he got brought in front of the Inquisition, Goya, is because Godoy was actually really controversial because he was the prime minister. And this was one of the really controversial things that he did, having this terrible painting. Wow. And it was, Goya kind of got pulled into the Inquisition because they were going after Godoy. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. It, it's a painting that has caused controversy for not just his period, but well long after his death. 155 well long. years. Yeah. Well long. Well long, well long yeah. man. <laughs> Bare long. Um, <laughs> he, he used to say, people used to go to Godoy's house and go, that is a bare good painting. And he goes, you think this is bare good? <laughs> no, he, um, so many, many years later, it's issued in Spain as a stamp. And this is suddenly the first stamp where there's a naked woman oh, on a stamp. No. And in America, and this is 1959, they banned it. So really? any letters that came into America, they said, we will not forward them on. There were a few cases where at the post office, they would actually just, you know, um, they'd scrap, scroll, out the yeah, stamp, scroll yeah. it over and stuff like that and then send it on. But it was a huge, huge problem. That's amazing. Loads yeah. of people had the letters returned yeah. because of, yeah. Wow. It's a, the, a Time magazine wrote, an indecent picture is bad enough, but a postage stamp whose backside must be licked Millions, <laughs> millions of innocent children collect stamps, and so yeah. And yeah. there were there were certain places that kind of allowed it, but eventually they did ban but it. But it entirely. didn't have a picture of her bum on the back that you could lick, did no. it? <laughs> so we don't know who the woman is in that painting, but there's a pretty good chance that it's at least partly based on the Duchess of Alba. Uh, who was supposedly Goya's mistress. They were definitely very good friends. We're not sure if they were. Um, um, but they were definitely good mates. <laughs> so, is that a little that sounded like a build a whistle. They, they looked after a small bird together. <laughs> that right. sounded like an actual sensor on our show that you said a swear word and it's now been whistled over. I thought now that we're possibly going on BBC Sounds that I should not be saying fucking. Yeah, true. Um, anyway, the Duchess of Alba's uh, full name actually was Doña Maria del Pila Teresa Cayetana de Silva Alvarez de Toledo y Silva Bazan Decimo Tercer. Duquesa de Alba de Tormes, Decima Primera Duquesa de Huasca, Sexta Duquesa de Montero, Octavia Condesa Duquesa de Alvarez, Decimo Primera Marquesa del Capio, Decimo Tercera Marquesa de Coria, Nonaba Novena, Mar I won't do them all. It's 754 letters in total, her oh full God. name was. Oh, oh, my God. Uh, so either we have to say this fact or we have to say all the other facts. It's <laughs> <laughs> not time for both. Too um, so so yeah, and her descendant who died in 2014, who was actually a quite famous Duchess of Alba, the one who was in the painting was the 13th, and the one who died in 2014 was in the Guinness World Records as the aristocrat with most titles. Uh, oh, she was a bit of an eccentric. Really? Yeah. Uh, and the Duchess of Alba, who's in the painting, there's an interesting thing about her is she was one of the most powerful people because she was also supposedly the mistress of Godoy, the prime minister. Uh, but she had a bit of a beef with Maria Luisa, who was the queen consort, who was married to Charles IV. These were the two most powerful women, and they really, really hated each other. And one day, the queen consort was going to go to a party, and the Duchess of Alba found out what she was going to wear and got all of her maids to wear exactly the same clothes as the countess and mm -hmm. go to the party. So suddenly, there were like 20 women all wearing exactly the same clothes. That could be seen as flattery. 
it wasn't. It was I seen as famously women hate that. <laughs> it was seen as a massive, massive slam. <laughs> Do they? Women, you say? They don't like that. Oh. Well, it was seen as a massive, massive slam. So much so that we think that the Queen Consort had the Duchess of Alba murdered. For oh, that. oh wow! Wow! Yeah. For wearing the wow for getting her maids to wear yeah. the same clothes. That is a practical joke gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. So God, this... I'm, I'm now terrified because sometimes me and Anne come into the office wearing the same jumper with a cuddly animal featured on the front. Yeah. Do you think she's plotting my demise? I feel like she might be. <laughs> Actually, they exhumed her body in 1945 and they think she Who probably Anne's? died. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, and she probably died of meningitis, we think, ah, after okay. being murdered. But yeah, that was yeah. the story for hundreds of years that that's what happened. That's really? amazing. The number of paintings by Goya is going down and down. By the day, right? It's a oh, real. No. I, I'd be more surprised if it was going up. This is dead. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good point. <laughs> I suppose sometimes you find paint. No, you're no, that, right. that no, is true. true. You do just go that's and you lost paintings. That's true. He might have had another like a shed or something that he painted all over that we haven't discovered yeah. yet. Absolutely, he yeah. might have had a second home that he rented out as an Airbnb, but then it turns out that it had paintings on it. Yeah. But none of these things are true, we is what we're we, saying. It, well, I think what we're saying is we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we just don't know. If you're staying in an Airbnb with disturbing paintings on the wall, get in touch. That's, that's every Airbnb in my experience. <laughs> Have you ever stayed in, like, stayed in like a tastefully decorated Airbnb? Okay, you need to up your budget very slightly, <laughs> yeah, Alex. I do, I do. He's a lower class dandy. How <laughs> Um, so this is because basically lots of paintings that we thought were by him turn out not to be by him. Oh, really? And when, you know, modern analysis is done, it looks very closely at brush strokes and the type of materials that were used and they make certain deductions. I'm always sceptical, you know, so there's um, actually one of his most famous paintings, Colossus, they now think was not painted by him. And there's one expert called Manuela Mena, and she says that the brush strokes are inferior to what he would have done. Mm. You can tell that the confidence with which they were made is not an expert. And you think he could just be having a bad yeah. day. Yeah. Can I just mm. say, if people in the like 200 years, they listen to episode 183 yeah. of the podcast, <laughs> go, they weren't very funny in that one. So I don't think it was them. <laughs> not them. Yeah. That's that AI thing, dubbing yeah. over their voices. <laughs> Podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, everybody. We just wanted to let you know that we're sponsored this week by Squarespace. That's right, Squarespace. It's the all-in-one website platform that is used by entrepreneurs throughout the globe to help them make sure that their website stands out and has all the tools to run their business as smoothly as possible. That's correct. So if you have anything that you want to put up online, something to sell, just your own brand that you want to publish to the world, get to Squarespace. Now it's got so many advantages. So for instance, you could sell your products in an online store, whether you're selling physical, or digital or service products. Squarespace has got the tools you need for that. You can develop an asset library so you could upload and organize and access all of your content from one place with an asset library and you'd be able to manage all of your files from one central hub. Or you could host video content, for instance, and organize a video library. You can do it all. So if you need a website, if you need to get it up ASAP, Squarespace is the space for you. And if you'd like to get a bit of dosh off on your first purchase with Squarespace, you can use our offer code. Just head to squarespace.com slash fish and you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using the code fish. And we are also sponsored this week by Catkin. Yes, so if you have a cat, then something you should know about the current cat food industry is that it can be really below par. So a lot of wet and dry cat foods are very light on meat. They'll have as little as 4% meat in them. They're heat sterilized to last on supermarket shelves. So that destroys the nutrients. Catkin is a completely different option. So it is healthy, delicious, nutritious food for your cat. That's right. They use 100% real human quality meat. Now that doesn't mean they use <laughs> Using humans, it means the meat is so good that even as a human, you could eat it. So, as Anna was saying, these other cat companies, they'll use things like beaks and talons and scraps that are boiled off the bone. None of this stuff is in catkin. It is just great, gently cooked meat that kills all bad bacteria while protecting key nutrients, proteins, and amino acids to make sure that your cat is getting the best nutrients and the best possible food. They've researched exactly what cats have evolved to eat, the specific balance of protein, fat, moisture, and fiber, and they've recreated that. And the great thing is you can get it delivered to your door. It's perfectly proportioned. And they ask for the details of your cat when they sign up. So they deliver exactly tailored food for your cat. 
And if you go to Katkin, that's K-A-T-K-I-N dot com slash no such thing as a fish, you can get 30% off a trial box. Or you can use the code no such thing as a fish 30 on their website. That's no such thing as a fish 30, the digits on their website to get the same deal. That's right. So do go to catkin.com slash no such thing as a fish and you can use the offer code no such thing as a fish 30 and that will get you 30% off your trial box. Okay, back to the podcast. On with the show. Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that before governments experienced cyber attacks, they had to deal with fax attacks. Oh, what a great name. Alternate name for this podcast, fax attack. Fax attack, oh yeah. (laughs) That's true, yeah. Um, So this is a thing that's called a black fax, and people would do this as pranks, but they would do it to companies that they hated, they would do it to governments, where they would basically send over black paper from their side, and often they would would loop it round so their fax machine was just sort of eternally sending a fully black page. Like a conveyor belt. Like paper. a conveyor belt, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. And so the people receiving it, if they were not near their fax machine, suddenly they would be using all the ink up or they might even heat the machine up so much because so much of it was processing <laughs> these old pages. It. it would overload and it would sort of just... I suppose also means you can't use the fax while that's happening. Exactly. We should say, because people will write in, probably not ink so much as thermal paper. Yes, sorry. Right. Yes. But I love already the people who would have written in um, to complain about that. And I'm sorry we <laughs> corrected ourselves because I want to know you better. <laughs> Send your faxes yeah. to podcast.qi.com. Yeah. So yeah, it's a method that was done and it was done, you know, before cybercrime, if yeah. if we're being um, sort of talking about it loosely, because there are always examples of like the 1700s, a version of cyber Yeah, they say the first happened. one was like 18, yeah. 1834 was yeah. supposed to be the first oh, yeah. cybercrime. What crime. was that then? Well, it was, uh, it was in France and it was Obviously, before the internet was invented, and it was uh, a, a way of <laughs> sorry. Because these days they might not know. <laughs> um, and um, in, in those days, um, financial market data was um, like trading was happening, but it was sort of done via like letter. So if you were in a different town, like the information would travel quite slowly, okay. and people were always trying to find a way to beat that information, and people tried oh, like carrier pigeons yeah. and all sorts of stuff like this. Um, but one way it wasn't communicated was the telegraph system, which was used for other things. Um, but these two brothers, the Blanc brothers they set up a ruse with um with uh, with some of the telegraph operators where they smuggled <clears throat> little information indicators in other messages but uh-huh. the way the hack worked was that the information would be like single character like i suppose u for up or d for down or something like that to indicate mm-hmm. something to do with the stock market um but then if you followed that with a backspace character it meant that it wouldn't get written down because it would be regarded as a mistake but the telegraph operator would see it all so if they were in on it they could write down and be and be like oh, okay. yeah, this was sent over That's as a mistake and we're not writing it down but this is the information so and the idea being that you know if the price of gold has gone down, yeah, you so you could have sell it, it in for anyone else. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. That's clever. Do you think, obviously, if who was the modern artist we mentioned earlier? Was it Rothko who did all the black paintings? Oh, Malievich. There's Malievich. Awkward when he tries to fax the photos of his <laughs> new artworks through. I keep trying to send it to you. What? Stop pranking us. That's why it's worth so much. It's just the ink. <laughs> you no, know, it's not. It's not black. It's the Duchess of Alba's name in very small font. That's all it is. <laughs> Do you know who, as of 2017, so I don't know if it's changed, but the last report that I saw, 2017, was the biggest purchasers of fax machines in the UK? I NHS. Think I, I yes, it's the NHS. Yeah. 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 So interesting. They've, they've really phased it out since then, um, I think, haven't they? There was a big scandal a couple yeah, of years ago. Yeah, it was controversial. Ago, they were yeah, like, we've got to stop this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And pages as well, wasn't it? Yeah. I think they decided they wanted to get rid of them all. Also, the NHS still have a big dictaphone tradition where a lot of the older doctors still, instead of... Why lo- don't they just use their fingers? <laughs> 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 It's one of my favourite jokes. It's a brilliant joke. It's a great joke. It's great. Sorry, as you were saying. No, just that uh, loads of doctors still will be able to log in to the usual NHS account and when you go to the doctor, they'll make your medical notes and just put them into the system. A lot of older doctors still prefer to use dictaphones, i.e. manual dictaphones with like actual tape cassette tapes inside, dictate the notes, and then they're sent away to a third-party transcription service, and then the notes are sent back, and then the the doctors then check them, like the written notes, and then they're inputted to the system by someone else, and it's an insanely inefficient system. Them. You've got to feel bad about that, surely, <laughs> I know, yeah, doctors. I know, it's ridiculous. Uh, Miley Cyrus uses fax machines. Okay. Is this... Um, what for? For 
communicating. Everything, <laughs> really? Uh, no, only with one person. Okay. Uh, she uses them to communicate with her godmother, Dolly Parton, because Dolly Parton actually does use them for everything. Wow. Uh, she refuses to use text messaging and instead uses a fax machine for everything. Really? You really yeah. buried the lead there, but you were trying to get the kids in by saying, <laughs> Miley Cyrus uses, he sometimes uses a fax machine for Dolly Parton. That's amazing. Yeah. Dolly said, I don't want to talk to everyone that wants to talk to me. I don't text because I don't want to have to answer. So she thinks if people text her, she'd have to reply all the time. But with a fax machine, she can just like get the messages and then yeah, yeah, it's not. very indirect. You you don't you can't do the three dots thing, or you don't get seen on a fax. Yeah, like, no. you, yeah. but then it's still indirect this way because Miley Cyrus says that she doesn't really fax. Um, she has a phone. <laughs> what happens is Dolly Parton sends a fax. Then somebody at the other end scans the fax to see what it says and then writes it in a text message that gets sent to Miley Cyrus. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, so re- actually, the real leader of this fax is that somebody's job is sorting communications between Miley Cyrus and Dolly Parton exclusively. Are you telling me you don't want that job? Of course I want that job. (laughs) It must happen a lot. I mentioned years ago on the podcast that that's how Brian Blessed would do his tweets. So yeah, yeah, Yeah. it's the exact same thing. You would, you would, he would be sent the tweets to reply to, to his agent, fax it to him. He would fax back. Like there was a whole fax system. And he didn't write write out the replies by hand, which were then faxed back. And then they would be typed. I can't remember. It went through like eight different modes of communication. It was a lot, but maybe that's a, maybe that's more it yeah. can't just be Dolly and Br- Didn't, Blessed. Didn't um, Brian Blessed once tweet Miley Cyrus saying, can you tell Dolly Parton <laughs> to answer her phone? <laughs> I think it all had to go to the NHS in the end. It make it work. <laughs> Have you heard of the fax number of the beast? Okay, 666 something? It's 667. Oh. And it's quite just a little nice nugget for uh, phone numbers of faxes. Oh, because um, uh, of course your fax number used to be your phone number, but with one digit at the end gone one up. Yeah. Remember uh, that? Exactly. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So 667 is the fax number of the oh, beast. I see. Okay, sorry, according to people. Who, I think it's a joke, right? It's a little joke. It's a joke. Yeah. It's a joke. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah it's I'm a joke. joke. Yeah. yeah, no, nice. I like, sorry, I, I get it. <laughs> I like jokes. <laughs> I'm, a big, I'm a big joke guy. Yeah. <laughs> Before we had cyber, let's say, urban legends being sent through email and Facebook and oh, stuff like that, yeah. they were all done on fax machines. Yeah. Uh, mm. And in 1993, there was a big scare in Memphis, Tennessee, because there was a load of faxes going around about gangs would drive around with their lights off in their cars and if anyone flashed them to tell them their lights were off then they would chase them stop them and kill them oh my god was this not true because i heard this rumor quite recently (laughs) it's just got to anna's facts i mean that still goes around that rumor right but no it is it is fake but it was called fax law the culture of sending faxes around and it's that it was the old meme culture i think yeah exactly and when emails came along it just went from fax to email directly from Mm. there to there yeah so fax law was the name for the rumors the lies that were started yeah like folklore oh wow i thank you again i now get that that's a joke fax law <laughs> to play on words she likes jokes she loves ladies jokes. and gentlemen I'm, I'm joke guy <laughs> oh, the last Dick time I came on this podcast <laughs> um, do you know who else used to fax each other in the 80s well oh, loads give, of people give us <laughs> a, <laughs> a full list I framed that question badly I've got a better way of framing it yeah <clears throat> What was the and pretend that I didn't ask that previous question because okay. otherwise it'll give it away. What was the hotline between the White House and the Kremlin? Was it a fax machine? Dan, you I know you cheated <laughs> there. <laughs> using previous so, sorry, information. Was it, I always thought it was a red telephone. I, it wasn't a phone. That's Batman you're thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that was part of where the rumour came from that the hotline was a phone because I think it was in one of the Batman films mm. he speaks to the White House oh. on the phone anyway the hotline between the White House and the Kremlin famously started by Kennedy and Khrushchev in the 60s was never a telephone between them but it was in the 80s a fax machine mm. so it started with type so it was teletyped so it was basically like an old version of text where you'd type a message if you're in the White House or in fact in the Pentagon where it was, you'd type a message, it would be encrypted by people, sent to the Kremlin and then translated by someone at the other end into Russian. And it was quite sweet. At the start of the Cold War they swapped machines for this teletyping so the Kremlin posted to the US four of their teletype machines that could print stuff out in Cyrillic and the US posted back to the Kremlin four of their machines and they upgraded to fax machines in the 80s. 
1980s. So in the 1980s, if there was an emergency between uh, Reagan and Gorbachev, mm. then they faxed each other. There's there's many ways that people have to protect themselves against cyber attacks these days. Um, what do you reckon? This is now turning just into a quiz. Uh, the answer is not fax machine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what do you reckon? So like um, for the Navy how they get by uh, if they get cyber attacked for, let's say, their uh, GPS system is hit with malware from an unknown enemy and that's okay. scrambled. So you need to know which way to go, yeah. but your GPS is broken because you've been hit by cyber. Yeah. So um, pop up and look at the stars in your periscope. That's what it is. It's celest- oh, shit, sorry. Uh, celestial sorry. navigation. <laughs> They're all taught celestial no navigation, yeah. Which is I'd very- make such a great submarine captain because that was my first thought and I was like I mean I wouldn't know mm. how to do it no, but, but do, like <laughs> someone needs to celestially navigate thanks Alex that's yeah, why I'm the saying, captain's there I was there. Say captain I'm in charge I'm not actually doing anything I'm just telling people what to do right Anna but like uh, think about how like quickly I made that decision yeah. on who's the right one uh, go on no no it wasn't funny oh <laughs> and she knows funny <laughs> <laughs> So um, you, we mentioned the number of the beast earlier on. Yes. I've got a little quiz for you. Oh, great. Um, are the following things the names of cyber attacks or the names of bands who have opened for Iron Maiden? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go for Shady Rat. Shady Rat's a band, surely. Yeah. Cyber I'm going to go cyber attack. It's a cyber attack. Wow. Uh, it was, in fact, it was a series of cyber attacks in the late 2000s, uh, originated from China. Uh, Night Dragon. Cyber attack. Band. Cyber attack. Oh, Dan, you suck at this so badly. <laughs> Around the same time as Shady Rat, these were attacks on energy companies. Uh, Nitro's use. Cyber attack. I'm going to go banned this time. Banned. Cyber attack. <laughs> Anna knows how my brain works. <laughs> Everyone knows Iron Maiden have a policy of never having a supporting act. <laughs> uh, these were attacks on Iran by the US um, that were planned if nuclear talks failed. Um, let's go for Vinnie Vincent Invasion. <laughs> okay, that I'm going to say is a band. Surely it's a band. Yeah. Dad? Band. <laughs> I am going to say Cyber Attack. Oh, I know you've lost it. Hey! I actually run out of Cyber Attacks now. I did them all at the top. <laughs> I was looking at other like kind of non-digital ways of hacking things, and um, did you have you heard of token suckers? So this was for many years. The New York subway ran on tokens. Uh, it was t- you would buy tokens which would go into the slots to let you through the barriers, and it was because I think the denominations of coins never always matched up with the fares. And mm-hmm. there were people called token suckers who would steal tokens by jamming up the slot in the machine with a bit of paper, so that when people put their token in, they'd lose it, but it wouldn't go all the way in. And then they would come back and they would s- crouch down and suck the token out with their mouth with their mouth really yeah. yeah that's a hell of a vacuum you got in your mouth if you can suck a coin out of a slot yeah I think if it's just inside you can kind of never try it. Get it. No, you could yeah, maybe use your tongue to just sort of wiggle it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you then could you take can a like... hoover take a vacuum cleaner to the station like uh, a Dyson it looks more suspicious, I think that but attacks yeah. attention but they used to some of the subway station attendants would um, put chilli powder in the slots as a deterrent which is oh, quite really? cool. yeah <laughs> that's nice you could get half a tennis ball and stick it on and then wham it, wham it and that creates a vacuum and then when you pull it off it would suck it Really? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, yeah, any plunger, I guess. Plunger be, yeah. would do yeah. the same job. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> made to yeah. <laughs> okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is Anna. My fact this week is that for 200 years, humans made wire by soaking steel in urine before realising that water works just as well. <laughs> oh God, we're so stupid. I love it. I mean, how recent was this? Was this like last year we worked this so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Someone squatting down to urinate on the steel again, saying, oh, we definitely not just put it under the tap. <laughs> what was the thought behind it? Well, um, I read this in a great book actually called How to Invent Everything. And the thought I think was that urine was used in ver- for various things um, historically, wasn't it? You know, like t- the tanning industry springs to mind, but go through the podcast archive. It was used for millions of other things. And so this was in Altena in Germany, and it was in 1650. And at that point, to make wire out of steel, you had to pull a steel rod, so like a thicker rod of steel, through a funnel of decreasing diameter. So you know like when you did filtration in science, you had those funnels, and so you'd put steel in the wide end and you drag it through until it gets thinner and thinner, and then you get a thin wire coming out the other end. And to stop there being too much friction, because you're putting it through really hard, you use grease or oil, 
And then in this place called Altena in Germany, someone, um, according to reports from the time, accidentally sort of urinated all over it and then tried it <laughs> and found that it works just as well as the grease and oil. And so really? thought, oh, it must be something special about the wee. I believe I found something from quite near the time that said that this guy who's called Johann Gerd, Gerdes, or yeah. Gerds, um, he had been so annoyed that he couldn't draw it well enough that he'd thrown his material Voyedemann Sien Vasa Abschlag yes. uh, which is where everyone casts their water so he didn't urinate on it, he got annoyed and threw it in the corner into the toilet uh, and that's where he yeah, exactly. Okay, so right. he, he tossed it into the loo and then he thought, oh no, that was, I threw a strop there, that was silly wasn't I, but I'll go and get it back and so then he went and sort of got, <laughs> went elbow deep pissy metal back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> climbed down into the vat of wee, got it back out <laughs> and then uh, found that it works better and, and when you say work better is it just that it's softer and more malleable or? yeah so what it seemed to do, what it did do is make a soft coating around the metal mm. which reduces the friction when you pull it through, mm. now we now do know that water also does that but for 200 <laughs> years people who worked in this factory would provide urine to it and actually their wives and children would also donate their urine to this factory. I like the fact that they, in between the we and the water, mm -hmm. they worked out that beer worked. Oh, really? So like, they did it with the we for ages, and then after about a hundred years, someone tried beer. They went, "Oh, this works just as well. That's we don't so need good. to piss Why did on they it stop anymore." Stop trying. Why did like, like try like a hundred different things? Yeah. <laughs> maybe they did. I kind of wonder what else would work that we haven't thought of yet. That's yeah, like better than water. I, I think know. once you've got to water, it's like yeah. okay, good. Yeah, this is I the suppose. simplest trick. I'd, I'd so love to have been there on the day that the person who came into town and said, "You know, you can just use water." So <laughs> <laughs> they've said that. So like, can you? Or, or like dicks in hands? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Standing here. Dick in Dick <laughs> You'd be so embarrassed. How long have you been doing this? 200 years. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Two important. doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Even I think safe. it's also interesting that like you make wire like you make spaghetti. You just yes. squeeze it in a... I mean, yeah. I piss on my spaghetti. I mean, squeezing it through, <laughs> squeezing it through a Actually, thing. Actually, if you cook it in water, it's even oh, better. Yeah, I didn't know you. <laughs> <laughs> you know that smell that iron and steel has, like doorknobs and stuff? You know that oh, yeah. smell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the metal smell. So you actually don't because it turns oh. out that it doesn't <sighs> smell. And oh. you know what it actually is, is the oils and chemicals excreted by you reacting with the surface of the metal. Very similarly, and every kitchen should have this. I don't have this, but you can get stainless steel soap. And I'd never heard of that before. Oh. Yeah. What? Well, yeah. Well, because stainless steel is like antibacterial, right? Which is why like a lot of doorknobs are made out of it. And especially when you go into public toilets and stuff, everything's metal. Because yeah. it, it, bacteria can't last very long on it. Well, the, so you don't need to wash your hands when you're leaving the loo. You just turn the metal doorknob and you say, I'm done, as long as you do it with you're, both hands. You're not made of metal, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is specifically for if you're cutting up onions or you're cutting up garlic and the, mm. and the smell gets stuck to your mm. fingers and you're like, oh, God, I oh, smell yeah, of yeah. this. Rubbing your hands against stainless steel creates a reaction that knocks out the smell from it. Mm. This is, I've tried I, don't, this I don't think before. it's scientifically proven at all, but they do sell, as it were, bars of stainless steel. I actually so. think it is scientifically proven. Yeah. What? But it doesn't really work. That's exactly oh. it. The, the science it's not, it's is isn't legit. isn't actually practical. But it's like, mm, yeah. nah, I've definitely rubbed my garlicky fingers up and down stainless steel stuff to no avail. Yeah. And does real soap not work at all for garlic? Uh, no, I don't think it, I don't think anything works for it except using garlic in a jar, which I've resorted to now in order to sustain my marriage. I think just being <laughs> happy with smells of garlic. All is... that, James. I wish yeah. life were that simple. Yeah. <laughs> what a weird cryptic sentence about your marriage that just slipped in there. <laughs> like, Anna's in... husband is a vampire. <laughs> I should say that. <laughs> um, can I give you a QI question? But you've got to pretend you're in ancient Rome. And then it works. Sure. Do we have to do it in Latin? <laughs> yes, right, so that's okay. okay. I'm sure the listeners at home are fluent. Right. Um, so... Salve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Alex actually can do this. <laughs> yes, oh, yes. No. This guy studied this Latin. Good, yeah. <laughs> All right. You only need to know one word, and that's that the Latin word for steel, and, and astonishingly, they had a version of steel as far back as then, invented in India about 400 BC, but it wasn't able to be mass-produced until the 19th century. But they did have it, made it to ancient Rome. The Latin word for steel is chal Bay, and it was named after the Chalibes people who lived on the Black Sea. Hmm. Okay, so you're in Latin QI. Yeah. What did the Chalibes people invent? Uh, the Chalibi people, they made metal. I mean, they the invent... Latin for steel is Chalibe. I'm just going to say that. Oh, okay. I see. Your, your is, it the word, is it the word calibre? 
Um, oh. Excalibur, swords. Dan, can I, I feel like you're the one who gives the more obvious stupid answer. Can you All do right, that sorry. now? I'm still busy Challenge. trying to picture myself, uh, what character I am, <laughs> what do I know, what do I not know. Chali Bay, and what, there's supposed to be an obvious answer to this. That they invented steel. Oh, they invented steel. Did they invent steel? And then you get a klaxon. Um, right, so, <laughs> what? Okay. what? I don't understand what's going on. Oh, thank God Anna didn't pitch QI to the BBC initially. Anna's a script editor. I don't understand how she's made such a mess of this. I've rewritten all the scripts in Latin. This is so awkward. Um, I'm saying to a Latin audience, what did the Chalibes people invent? You know, speaking Latin, that I Chalibe see. is Means Latin for steel. steel. Yeah, so we'll say steel. Okay, so steel. Woo, woo. Steel. Klaxon. Woo, okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I see. And they so. didn't. They just invented another kind of hybrid iron. They had <laughs> Do you want to hear about the barbed wire wars? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so barbed wire invented in 1873 in America by Joseph Glidden and used by farmers to protect their farms. Who was not happy about it? The blunt wire manufacturers. <laughs> uh, yeah, fence, fence makers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, Ramblers. Ramblers, lots of ramblers. Yeah, in golfers. Yeah. Golfers. <laughs> yeah, these are all great answers, um, uh, but all wrong. I mm. actually feel like ramblers, because I think I I may know the answer, but ramblers oh. might be a vaguely correct-ish. People who wanted to ramble, right? I think it's true. I mean, not many people like barbed wire, I'd say. But um, the answer is cowboys, mm. uh, because if you had a if you had a farm and you didn't have fences, your cows and sheep could run anywhere but you kept them in the right place by employing cowboys. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you had barbed wire, you didn't need to employ cowboys oh, anymore. This is first who, ramble, oh. who ramble freely, which is why I've given Alex half the points. <laughs> ramble, Wait. they're on horses. They, yeah, I think if rambling is just sort of roaming free, but yeah. you're, do you think it has to be on foot? I think what we're doing now is rambling. For sure. <laughs> but the other thing, the other people who didn't like it were small ranchers, because if you had a big ranch and you could afford loads of barbed wire, you could put loads of barbed wire around your farm. But actually, in those days, people weren't really sure where one farm stopped and another farm started. So if you were a small rancher, you would often find that you would turn up to your ranch and there's a load of barbed wire and you couldn't get to your stuff anymore. Mm. And so there was um, a huge amount of violence and tension between these kind of small ranchers and the big ranchers and they were there were wire cutting groups that would go out and cut all the wires and actually Grover Cleveland the president had to send in the army to remove any unlawful barbed wire fences yeah. didn't they have, they formed sort of gangs didn't they with really fun names they were called like the blue devils the owls they supported Iron Maiden didn't they <laughs> <laughs> sorry you're right <laughs> Um, Native Americans as well didn't like it because it stopped buffaloes rambling. <laughs> I'm going to make ramble happen. And they depended so much on their livelihood for buffaloes. It's one of the reasons that buffaloes basically went extinct by the end of the century is that um, they, they couldn't roam free anymore. They were fenced in. Mm, right. And it was all kind of Lincoln's fault, wasn't it? Because he signed this act which said everyone can have a bunch of free land in the Wild West if you agree to farm it. So all these mm. farmers move there and then we're like huh right. how do we how do we stop these buffalo from trampling all over our crops mm. yeah bloody Duncan. Got electric wire right after the barbed wire yeah, mm. yeah I've, i'm just trying to think i wonder how many people died in that small town who were having a nostalgic <laughs> piss on a bit of wire i think that's a uh, myth isn't it that if you piss on an electric fence you get electrocuted don't uh, try okay. it at home and don't try to who's got electric fence <laughs> <laughs> Get out of my room, Mum. I did warn you. <laughs> I think the myth that I remember, and again, I'm not sure that this is true, so people shouldn't try it at someone else's home, <laughs> uh, but your urine stream isn't usually a complete stream. It's usually got gaps in it enough that the, mm. um, the electricity can't travel up it. Oh. Did anyone come across this Guardian notes and queries section? So, you know, the Guardian does notes and queries and someone asks a question, and lots of, you, often people who have inside knowledge yeah. answer yes. underneath. And there's one that's when was wire invented. Okay. Did any of you see this? No. It's just very confusing. So there's when was wire invented and then various people underneath give their answers. And one of the answers is fierce controversy surrounded the invention of wire. Mm. And it goes on to explain that Thomas Malham said he invented wire in 1830 at his foundry in Sheffield. But a Frenchman, Jean-Francois Martin, also um, said he'd invented wire at the same time. There was this legal action contesting the right to the patent. It was never resolved because Thomas Malham died of an inflamed liver. 
Um, and then it said, it's extraordinary fact. Thomas Malham's memorial is in Abney Park Cemetery, very near where I used to live, which has lots of amazing gravestones on it. And it's now rusted away, but it used to be constructed entirely of wire in the shape of an anvil topped mm. with a falcon. And the source was a book called Wire, Its History and Application by Dr. A. Stone. And... (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) It's a different material. (laughs) Well, it is a different material. But there's nothing obvious in this to give away that it's completely made up. It's completely made up. Oh, it's completely made up. Oh, okay, fine. This this person gives this extraordinary story of the history of the founding of Wire. And I was like, brilliant, something fascinating. God, there's Abney Park. I can't believe I never saw that. Completely so false. So this is the story of you reading a comment section, finding the information not to be true. It's and not then, a comment right? section. It's Guardian notes and queries. Okay, you get highbrow experts you replying do? to yeah, people about, and then. But the jokers oh, can slip in. That's the problem. Yeah, it's not a very good in. joke, though, is it? I don't know. A stone. A stone? A stone? Pretty good. <laughs> I did laugh. I did laugh really hard. At it. yeah. <laughs> That's not a joke. <laughs> I know jokes, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just on other things you can use urine for, virgin boy eggs. Oh, yeah. Do you remember oh, yeah. this? Boy this is like so. They are a traditional dish um, from China, uh, from Dongyang, and basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. They boil eggs in the urine of young boys, so like ten or younger. That's not what virgin boy eggs sounds like. It's, it's going to be. It's what it trans- say- sorry, it translates with boy eggs. Fine, like again, urine boy eggs. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Urine boy eggs. Yeah, got it. You're trying. No, sorry. They are. They translates as virgin boy eggs. Virgin boy being like small boy. Eggs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, yeah, they um, all through the town. The kids are encouraged to when they go to the loo in schools, they either can go to the normal toilet or they can go and pee in like a collection bucket in the corridor. Um, and then <laughs> all of this, all of the, all of this urine gets um, taken, and then eggs are boiled in them. And there's, it's a whole process where like they're double boiled in this urine, and, right. and people eat them, and it's like a delicacy. And so yeah, weird. urine's been used like that for a lot, hasn't it? Yeah, it's just interesting. There is a, definitely like a legit ick factor there, where I'm like, it's somebody else's urine that this has been. Yeah. In, yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Oh, I had yeah. hundred years eggs. Hundred years eggs. Yeah, they're like supposed to be a hundred years old. They're not really a hundred years old, but they are quite very old. Very old. Yeah. Yeah, and they just taste really sulfurous. Mm. Mm. But they haven't been bathed in urine, have they? No, they're years just. Eggs. They're, they're just a yeah. different kind of weird. It's egg. the urine yeah. thing I don't like. Yeah. I can talk about weird eggs that I've eaten. I had that <laughs> balut, you know, that has the um, baby chickens, the embryo of the chicken. Oh yeah. yeah. All right, well, so, save it for your spin off Weird Eggs I've Eaten podcast, <laughs> which will run forever and ever. It's, they've actually poached me. Oh, poached me. Hey! hey. Uh, the rest is Weird Eggs. <laughs> you. Go back your podcast. <laughs> It's me and Delia Smith just talking about weird eggs. Weird eggs. Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hey everyone, this week's episode of Fish is sponsored by Aura Frames. Yes, Aura Frames is the ideal gift to give this Christmas to family or friends. Basically, you send someone a digital Aura frame and by downloading the app at your end, you can always project into that frame whatever picture you want to. It can be a picture of you opening the Christmas present they sent you that day. It can be an incredibly embarrassing photo that they forgot you took years ago. It can be whatever you want them to see. That's right. And you can upload a zillion photos there is no limit on the aura frame the space is wide open you can get as many photos up there so every day as you're walking around your house this photo frame can just show you a new amazing memory that you haven't seen in years and make you just smile it's the whole point of it it's a big old smile frame it's a smile frame and not only that it's the best one according to the strategist wired wire cutter all these sites have named that the best digital frame and if you go to Aura Frames, that's A-U-R-A frames.com slash fish, you can get $30 off their best-selling frames. That's right. So head to AuraFrames.com, that's A-U-R-A frames.com slash fish, use the promo code fish and get $30 off their best-selling frames. Terms and conditions apply. On with the podcast. On with the show. Okay, it's time for our final fact of the show, and that is Alex. My fact this week is that dragonfly wings are equipped with tiny knives that physically rip bacteria apart. What? Nice. It's amazing. Oh my god. It's just a a property they have that keeps their wings clean. It keeps them safe. Can I ask a question, Alex, straight off the bat? 
Um, I've currently got a chest infection and I'm on antibiotics. Could I instead chuck some dragonfly wings? That's such a great question. I don't want to answer that <laughs> in case you die. <laughs> um, I thought you were going to say, should I strap a series of knives to my arms and flap them around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it is. Also an option. I think probably not. I think dragonflies are amazing and humans used them as inspiration for scientific innovation so much. But one of the things that we are doing is trying to emulate this what's called they're called nano pillars these tiny tiny sort of blunt pillars that are so so small they're one hundred thousandth of the width of a human hair i mean so so tiny yeah. oh so God. bacteria literally lands on them gets caught between two and gets ripped apart i mean it's absolutely astonishing how small it's there's more than 10 billion of them per wing basically on each one mad. yeah what? and it, they're really really good at destroying almost all bacteria that lands on them so there's a university in melbourne australia who have um, successfully made a sort of plastic version so that could be the new stainless steel um, wow. you know next time you go into your public bathroom there'll be a plastic handle and Couldn't we, so yeah. scientists <laughs> have managed to make stuff that small yeah yeah well yeah. done well, i didn't make, well, you i didn't see they, they sort of you can do novels on rice now yeah you know, um. <laughs> you know that that's quite different to having something that there's 10 billion of yeah. them i don't think i don't think they've been manually sharpening each one with a tiny tiny <laughs> set of carving knives or anything i once pushed an electron with a scanning tunneling microscope wow right and it took me about an hour and a half <laughs> really <laughs> When it was quite a long two? time ago. No, just like to slightly other place to where it already was. Like I just moved it. <laughs> Can you just blown it? No, because it's an electron. It's so small. Oh, okay. So you have this little sort of, it's like a needle, but it's a, some kind of quantum effect. I don't know. I did study it, but I don't really right. understand it. But I had the machine and then it was like a computer game thing and you would kind of push this one electron. And the idea oh, is they, they meant used you to. to. Yeah, they it wasn't like OCD. To. You didn't just—it's like walking in and seeing a painting slightly askew. You're like, oh, I'm really uncomfortable with that. that really, is princess in the pea. Yeah. Yeah. This place is such a mess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, dragonflies are actually astonishing. They're incredible. They are yeah. amazing. Every fact I learn about them is that you're the most metal, insane. They are the most efficient killers in nature. They are the the, the most efficient predators. They kill over 95% of the prey that they chase yeah. which is uh, like that's unbelievable it's, we're so lucky they're so small and they don't eat us yeah I love you calling them the most metal they've opened for Iron Maiden yeah <laughs> <laughs> when they're um, lava so like little worm mm. things they kind of live underwater and then they shed their larval skin and start to become a dragonfly and they create these wings but the wings are like made of jelly they're not like the wings that they have when they're older so they need to dry them out and so they cr produce sodium bicarbonate in the rectum and they fart it out and it reacts with the water and it creates CO2 and it dries out their wings. Which wow. Which means that they become proper wings. They Incredible. are their own hairdryer. Their ass That's amazing. is a hairdryer, yeah. But also when they're larva, they eat through their anus as well. And then they also spend most of their lives as larva. So they can, some species live up to five years, but they spend nearly all of it as a larva. And then they become a dragonfly for just a couple of months and flying around. I always think it's weird with, it's not weird at all, but it's unfair to these animals that we think of them as dragonflies when mm. actually for almost all their life, they're not dragonflies 100%. at all. Yeah. I think they want oh. to be thought of as dragonflies rather than these weird underwater <laughs> <Do you> insects. <laughs> a bit creepy, yeah. Yeah. It must be, I watched a great, um, I watched a couple of great documentaries actually about them. One of them was talking about the extraordinary moment when they're climbing up a blade of sort of grass which mm. they would do when they're emerging from nymph phase into dragonfly phase mm. climb a blade of grass out of the water and that first time that you feel the weight of gravity on you they've been floating in water all of their lives and oh. suddenly they slow down massively because it's suddenly yeah. having to wrench their body weight oh, wow. up and then if you watch videos of them emerging from the exoskeleton it's very cool so their abdomen uh, as a dragonfly is concertinaed just like a telescope inside of their larval self <laughs> Wow. So when they burst out, suddenly it's like pulling a telescope out to its full extension. Wow. And um, when they climb up, they can retreat at any point. So they're not dragonfly yet until their massive goggly eyes, you know, they've got these big eyes, until their eyes turn cloudy and white. And then once the eyes have gone milky, there's no going back. Oh my God, that's yeah. incredible. That's wow. awesome. That's how you can tell. Wow. Did yeah. you know they can't walk? They've got six legs. 
and they can climb with them, but they can't walk on them. But they mostly use them to like grab their prey in midair and like stab it. And like, wow, they're yeah. not called dragon walks, Alex. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it's weird having like as in most most flies and insects that land can also walk on their. That yeah. they use it to like yeah. stand and walk, whereas dragonflies specifically use it to grab and hunt. They're more like pincers. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Okay. They're so awesome that the US decided to create a spying dragonfly drone. Um, which was based on all these amazing things that dragonflies could do. So Ooh. it had tiny beads that could reflect light and could check for oscillations. So you could work out what someone was saying from a massive distance away. It could flap its wings 1,800 times per minute using lithium nitrate crystals controlled by lasers. Wow. Um, it cost about $2 million for each one. Uh, but they only ever tested it in lab conditions. And then when they took it out, they realized it couldn't cope with wind. Oh, no. <laughs> I am... Um found a documentary by David Attenborough which was called Dragons and Damsels he okay. made it in 2019 it was a TV special and I really wanted to watch it and so I was googling Dragons and Damsels to see where you could get it yep Sadly, the closest I could get was a documentary of similar length, about 45 minutes, <laughs> called Dra called Dragons and Damsels, released on YouTube by Buxton Civic Association <laughs> <laughs> during the pandemic and hosted by a chap called Richard Nisley Marple, um, which was really good as well. And so What's I'm going to tell you it? some things I've learned from that. Well, oh, it was yeah. about Dragons and Damsels. The, the production quality is slightly lower. <laughs> there were interruptions like, can you see my cursor as I'm moving it out there? <laughs> <laughs> and sort of, can everyone see me on the screen or can you see the thing I'm showing you <laughs> but um <laughs> never get Attenborough doing that flying out to the arc and be like well, why can't I see them <laughs> <laughs> but I would love to see Attenborough doing a new narration over this yeah. documentary <laughs> here we see the human attempt the cursor <laughs> yes the thumbnails have confused the Jesus out of him but was he, it good though it yeah. was really good so he said sweetly he said the southern hawker dragonfly um they're the only dragonflies that will fly up to you and look you straight in the eye. That's so scary. Wow. He said it's quite frightening. Yeah. Just Sounds like a US drone, doesn't yeah. it, really? Maybe that's what Donners. they are. They always have been. Um, he said the way to tell the difference between damselflies and dragonflies, well, there are many ways, but one of them is, and you have to look quite closely, but during mating, they both grab the female from behind, but dragonflies grab the female um, on the back of the head, whereas damsels grab the female on the back of the neck. So you do have to be quite close. Oh, wow. <laughs> and also, I really enjoyed a metaphor he used, which actually referenced a fact that we mentioned before, which is that ancient dragonflies millions of years ago were up to a metre wide. And as he said, you can imagine what sort of a mess that would make if it hit your windscreen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I actually laughed. Yeah. I laughed out loud at that. And I've never laughed out loud at David Attenborough. Or any of our jokes on this <laughs> podcast yet. Yeah. She knows jokes. <laughs> she does. <laughs> Anyone knows jokes. Um, but don't the female dragonflies also, they fake their deaths to avoid having sex sometimes? Yes. Oh, they do do that, don't they? And yeah. the other thing I know about dragonfly sex is that the males have spoon-shaped penises so that they can scoop out sperm of the previous guy if he finds any inside. Oh, mm. that is clever bit gross but yeah, yeah. But well no but necessary right well yeah i suppose so arguably humans have that as well really? what yeah. the idea is that the the bell end shape at the top of a penis could possibly be used to scrape oh, out other people's semen yeah or in theory or just get a half cut tennis ball and you can <laughs> <laughs> plunge that out <laughs> okay. i'm actually starting to question your fact now alex having just looked at my notes uh because anna previously gave us a fake fact from a stone um, <laughs> and your fact about an insect comes from someone called a wolf <laughs> really yeah <laughs> it's dr annalena wolf um she does make this there's this amazing point that's made inside this article which you touched on earlier which is basically all the things that we're looking for from modern invention evolution has worked out somewhere on our planet yeah, we just need to common. look around for yeah. four billion years worth of evolution and you eventually find something that can be then taken into the lab to try and mimic which is pretty awesome it's the mimicking that's hard i think sometimes we actually don't have four billion years to make it we've got about a week before the funding dries up yeah <laughs> <laughs> but they've, they've been around 300 million years Dinosaurs were walking the planet. I mean, that's always because in my head, the romanticism of the dinosaurs being just because of how old they were and alive, and we forget all these animals. Yeah. The dragonflies were there. It's I sure a different version. In fairness to people who make cartoons, 
and dinosaur movies, they do often have dragonflies flying around. Yeah, they, they do. do. They do. Really, that's really true. big dragonflies. Yeah, that's so true. That is true. Yeah. One other incredible thing about them you wouldn't expect is how far they can fly. And that's another thing yeah. that scientists are looking into. Can we replicate it? Because the globe skimmer dragonfly has the record for the longest insect migration. And it does a round trip of 18,000 kilometers. That is insane. It's always one of these things where I think, does it count if it's multi-generational? <laughs> yeah, Because it, yeah. it is one of these yeah. things where the dragonfly, this particular dragonfly, lays its eggs and lives and mates in shallow pools because the pools are warmer right. if they're shallow and so it can grow faster. So it follows the rain so it can follow shallow pools. So it flies from India to Africa um, and then the next generation flies back. If I went on a gap year and then like I came back and it was my son, like you wouldn't be like how is how is Africa like, like, like is your dad Alex is so well travelled yeah. Alex and Alex Jr together <laughs> Okay, that is it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found at various places on the internet. I'm on Instagram on at Schreiberland. James? Uh, my Instagram is no such thing as James Harkin. Alex? I don't have any socials at the moment. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, look at me. Yeah. <laughs> Copycat. <laughs> Living my life. And Anna, uh, how can they get in touch with all of us? And you can get in touch with all of us by emailing podcast at qi.com or by tweeting at no such thing. That's right. Or you can go to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of the previous episodes are up there. Do check them out. Uh, also check out Club Fish, which is our behind the scenes special fun place where we have lots of bonus material, little fun extra shows like Drop Us a Line. Lots of great stuff there. Uh, but otherwise, just come back next week for another episode, and we'll see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye.